So I'm Suzanne McClure from the University of Liverpool. I am in the Department of English. I'm in my second year of my PhD. And my area of specialization is corpus stylistics. So it overlaps a little bit with Joanna's presentation. The focus of my research is uh, this English author who is always tagged as um, the first modernist novelist to come from a working class background, uh, D.H. Lawrence. But we're not going to really talk that much about him, but we will about the corpus. <laughs> work, work. Oh, was it the end? That was the problem. Oh, sorry, gang. We'll, we'll do this again. Oh. They said come early. We did. Tested it out. <laughs> <laughs> There. Nope, because that goes backwards. We could do. Could do. Yeah, Perfect. Yay! <laughs> Takes a village. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in, in, partic Ta -da! in particular today I'm going to talk to you about creating a methodological approach to creating a literary corpus. Um, I use the word heritage because I am only focusing on novels published between 1911 and 1928, um, and not all canonical works. But, um, and this is a quote by Lawrence from a book, Why the Novel Matters, and uh, it says that he is superior to the saint, among other things, um, because he is a novelist. And I don't study Lawrence because I think he's a great writer or a novelist. I study Lawrence because I think he's a really interesting person, and he said a lot of really interesting things as well. Um, OK, so corpus stylistics, relatively new field, uh, 15, 20 years or so. Um, and this is a definition from Paul Simpson, who I'm lucky enough to have him as my supervisor. Um, what I like, what he says here, is that um, sometimes we, we get eye-watering swaths of check textual material that we get to analyze because we have it in a corpus. For me in particular, and this is my own little diagram of how I look at it, is that it takes linguistics, which is the study of the structure and meaning of language. It takes stylistics, which is the study of literary style. It needs technology, as Paul mentions, and then it needs a corpus. And with that, you can then do quantitative research, which hopefully leads you to then your qualitative research, which is more about the close reading and delving into it. So, um, to create a, a literary corpus, you obviously need digital literary text. Um, there are, is an abundant uh, um, publicly available means of getting novels out there. Project Gutenberg is probably the most popular. One thing to keep in mind when getting novels or text from this website is that there's one in America, there's one in England, and there's one in Australia, and the copyright laws differ between the countries. So doing your research, you need to make sure that you got it and, and from the country that you're in that you're doing your research. There are other public domain websites as well. Um, so once you have your text, you can then tag it. And this is a concept that sounds a little bit unusual if you're not familiar with it, but I'll show you a video of what the tags actually look like. But what you're doing is you're taking the digital text and you're running it through some software, linguistic software. Um, Multidimensional analysis tagger, that's one of my favorite. What that will do is it will tell you the style and the genre of the text you're analyzing, and it's based upon somebody called Biber's Dimensions. Um, if you're going to create a corpus of romance fiction, you probably should make sure that all your texts that are in that corpus are classified as romance fiction, and this software uh, helps you do something like this. It also uh, uses the Stanford part of speech tagger, and then it adds an additional layer on top of it, and I really like how it tags for part of speech, um, more so than some of the other software. W Matrix is out of Lancaster. Um, this one tags part of speech, but it also does something quite unique, and that is, is it tags every word, every word of your corpus with its semantic meaning, your semantic domain. And I'll show you how that works as well in a little bit. <laughs> Wordsmith is very popular. Uh, that does keyword analysis, concordance analysis, cluster analysis, so on and so forth. And then Antcock uh, is pretty popular. Um, Antcock and um, the uh, multidimensional analysis tagger, those are both 
both free. The other two have licensing issues. Um, so that's the software I use in my research. There's a lot of other software out there. And we'll look at what the software does um, to your digital tech. Um, my corpus uh, is the Lawrence's 10 novels. And then you always need, you really always need a reference corpus. It's great to say that Lawrence said this or Lawrence did this, but it's best if you can compare it to his contemporaries. So in total, I have 95 novels totaling over 9.7 million words. Um, so 10 are Lawrence's and 85 novels are his contemporaries published between 1911 and 1928. Um, how you take these, these texts off of the Gutenberg website or wherever and, and drop them in for analysis is up to you. Uh, you had an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I use Microsoft Access. Um, Microsoft Access has a two gig limitation. And what you're doing is you have the text. The text alone, these 95 novels, they were over 50 megabytes of data. Well, now I've got them all tagged by semantic domain. I've got them tagged by part of speech, so on and so forth. So uh, it would have exceeded the access um, limits. So instead, I have individual databases with one front end that we'll see in a little bit. Um, all total over tw uh, two gigs of data. That was, that was about a year ago, so I'm sure that's much higher now. And this kind of illustrates why you need a literary reference corpus. Um, looking at the semantic domain fear and shock for Lawrence, um, I compared that to these, uh, the literary reference corpus and their usage of words that implied fear and shock. And it ended up with a log likelihood of 399. Statistically, any log likelihood over 3.84 shows that it's significant and it's not just due to chance. So for Lawrence to have a log likelihood of 399 when it comes to fear and shock, that means he was writing a lot about this subject. And it's, it's this type of quantitative uh, data that then can lead you down the qualitative path, just knowing this, OK, well, maybe there's a paper in there or something. Uh, what was Lawrence talking about? Why, why did he need to talk about fear and shock? Uh, historically, what was going on at that time? So. Uh, and this is just a little video to visualize this whole tagging thing. This is, this is my front end. And what we're going to look at is just, uh, just these drop-down lists. Now, these are the multidimensional analysis tags for each word. They are different than W matrix part of speech tags, which are here. But every word is tagged to its word class. Um, this is our semantic domains. I'm going to go in and look at caution in the Lawrence corpus and see the keywords and the frequency of those words that represented caution in his novels. Um, when it pops up there. And, and then, so watch, that word was tagged by W Matrix as being cautious, and, and Lawrence used it 640 times in his 10 novels. So that's what the tagging does. It just gives you. The, the, the list that for every single word. Um, this is the reference corpus, and I just went in to find the adjectives used in the unlit lamp. Again, that is the W matrix part of speech tagging. So it's this type of stuff that can just lead you down a path of qualitative um, research. Um, oh, this is the MDA tags going in to look at the demonstratives in Lady Chatterley's Lover frequency word count. All of this was written in Microsoft Access. My background is I have an MBA in information technology and an MA in applied linguistics. So the corpus stylistics is a bit easy for me. But I think most people these days are very good at the computers and programming. And Access is a pretty easy software tool to use and learn. So why, why does the novel, a few reasons why the novel matters. What can we do with this besides just research? Um, one thing is we can look at historical linguistics. We also can do detailed and exhaustive qualitative analysis based upon the quantitative analysis that we find. Um, and then it's also used for second language uh, teaching or learning, which I'll show you an example of as well. Um, so this word showed up seven times in Lawrence's novel, The Trespasser. And I didn't know what the word meant. Do, any of you, do, do all of you know what it is? I didn't know if it was a British American thing. No, OK, good, thank you. And it was in an important passage as well. Um, the, the main character is going to kill himself, and he's going to do it with a strap from this. And I don't know, I don't know what it is. But this is an illustration of um, 
bit of the horse historical linguistics. That word was first recorded in 1553. This is the sentence it was recorded in. The spelling was different then. And I was very happy to know that they consider it a band four word, which means it's only used 0.1 to one times per million words spoken today. So it isn't a common word. Um, so the corpus uh, stylistics, corporate li linguistics can pull out keywords that, that allow us to go back and, and uh, research uh, the words historical usage. Um, this was a study done by uh, Malberg and McIntyre uh, on the uh, novel uh, Casino Royale. And what they found, now they used uh, the W matrix semantic domain tagging uh, software for part of the research, as well as the keywords, which I think they may have used Wordsmith. But what they found from the W matrix tagging was that um, anatomy and physiology, now that's a, a semantic domain that W matrix has, um, that they found that um, there was a lot of um, body part nouns mentioned in Casino Royale. And then you look into it, is that significant in literature? It is. And then we come down here with, again, another example of why the reference corpus is important. It's showing that Fleming used uh, body part nouns much more often than uh, his contemporaries. So, and that was what their paper was published about, was the body part nouns in Casino Royale. Um, this is some research I did. Um, they say that Lawrence is a very polarizing author. He's always talking about opposition and oppositeness and so on. So I looked at what literary critics had to say, and these are different critics, and these are the different words that they use to describe uh, the things that Lawrence was talking about with his polarization. And then using W matrix again, I went in and you can say, okay, how does W matrix tag the word attraction or repulsion? And what you find is that it tagged it as 04.2, which is judgment of appearance. That's, that's just the category. Then you can go and work backwards and you can say, okay, I'm gonna find every word that was tagged 04.2, uh, judgment of appearance, I'm gonna go find uh, the frequency in the novels, and then you then becomes the qualitative nature of it and, what, and the close reading. What was he really talking about with repulsion and attraction? So another example of using uh, W matrix semantic domain for research. And then as far as language learning, this is a project called Click Dickens. It's out of the University of Lancaster, or University of Birmingham. And it was uh, Michaela Malberg's, I think her PhD thesis was based upon the creation of this. It's now a huge project. It is available publicly as well. And this is just one example of um, what you can do with the software. Over here you can decide whether or not you want to see Dickens novels or once again we see a reference corpus as well which is always important and so all I did was say I want to look at the Dickens novels and I want to look for the word home and if you were going to do uh, second language uh, teaching or even first language acquisition this is a concordance so you're looking at the words that surround the word home and it can illustrate that home can be a noun, an adjective, an adverb, a verb as well. Um, and then you can look at, well, when it's used as a noun, what words come before it? Are they definite articles, determiners, and so on? So something like this, these concordances, it removes, you're not really looking at Dickens anymore, but you're looking at a corpus um, of somebody that these people may know about and they may, want, uh, may read, but you're using it to teach language as well. And another example from the Dickens corpus um, that can be used for language instruction, this is what we call engrams and it's clusters of words. And again, I chose the Dickens novels and I said, you can t pick how many contiguous words you want. And I said, well, show me the five most frequent contiguous words in Dickens novels. And oddly enough, uh, the, the top two, it's a tie, is his hands in his pockets. Well, that can create a lot of discussion about his writing style and his imagery that he created. Um, the next one is in the course of. So then you can talk with your students about prepositional phrases. A lot of these are prepositional phrases. Um, so it's an interesting way to use literature to, to study language as well. Okay, so there's my email address in case anybody wants to talk about this. Whoops. <laughs> I have
have to hit play. Um, but I hope, I hope what I've shown today is that um, with uh, a literary corpus, you can look at micro detail of a text, but you can also look at very broad language patterns as well to come to conclusions, to lead you down new paths of research with the quantitative data. They may result in nothing, but it can at least lead you down some paths for qualitative research as well. And let's hope that we continue reading all of the great English novels. Thank you.